Hello church, wow, this is different, okay. I'm normally used to being there, standing here is a little bit different, but God's good, amen? Amen. It's good to be here. So my title for today's preach is, Where Do You Stand? Where Do You Stand? And I'd like to start things off by reading from Daniel chapter 3, verse 28. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angels to rescue his servant who trusted in him. They defied the king's command and were willing to die rather than to serve or worship God, except, uh, worship any God except their own God. Let's pray. Father God, Jesus, we just want to thank you today. Thank you for your word, Jesus. Thank you that your word has the power to change lives. Thank you that your word has the power to bring salvation. Today, Father Jesus, uh, I just pray that you would open our hearts and minds to listen to what you're about to say and to apply it to our lives so that we may be fruitful for your kingdom and for your glory. Amen. 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 I just want to ask you, has there ever been a time in your life where you were defiant? Yeah, a little quick show of hands. Don't worry, I'm not going to call you up for altar call. Just, just, just a quick show of hands. Yeah, okay, cool. So I'm going to take you on a trip down memory lane of a time where I was defiant and I had to... Uh, let's say, suffer a little consequence that's going to uh, be with me for the rest of my life. So we're going back to probably when I was around like seven or eight years old, right? As a kid, I loved fireworks, especially the sparklers, you know, the things that you spin around sparkle, yeah. And one day I convinced my mom to buy me a pack of sparklers. So she bought home a pack and then she told me, look, we're going to light this up at night so don't go near it until then. Do not go near them until then. Pretty simple instructions any kid should be able to follow, right? Pretty straightforward. But you see, I was, I was too curious. I couldn't wait till then. So I was like, you know what? I'm not going to wait that long. So 10 minutes later or something, mom goes to have a bath, and I'm on my way to the kitchen where I find the sparklers just laying that on the table. Yeah, it's just ready to be lit up. So I take one out. Just as I turn around to thinking about how am I going to light this up, I need some fire. I see some wood that's, been, that's just been put out of fire in the stove. Actually, back then, let me, let me give you a little, a little bit of context. This actually happened back in Sri Lanka, right? Where we used wood instead of gas. So just so you have a little bit of context. And you know when you put like fire out of wood, there's still like this red glowing bit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so I take the sparklers and put it on that bit. Just a couple of seconds of contact, and the sparkle is lit. Sparkles flying everywhere. Everything's going well so far. See, no one's in danger. <laughs> Nothing's being burned down. Everything is going well. So tell me why. Tell me why I thought it would be even better if I put a plastic bag on top of the sparkle. <laughs> Just tell me why. So, yeah, as you could probably think, yeah. So I did end up putting a plastic bag on top. And I start spinning it around, so the plastic bag, it begins to melt. And all that melted liquid is flying everywhere. It's flying here, flying there, it's flying everywhere. And one drop just lands right on my nose. And now I have to live with this as a reminder <laughs> for the rest of my life. For the rest of my life. Well, in life, guys, when we choose to defy and when we choose to stand up for something, we have to face some sort of consequence. Right, And today we're going to be looking at four people who are ready to stand up for God, who are ready to face any consequence that was coming their way because they were so strong in their faith in God. Well, the story actually starts from Daniel chapter 1, where Jerusalem has just been attacked by the Babylonian Empire. And a an year later, the city and the temple is burned. And loads of people, many Israelites from uh, Jerusalem, They've been taken to Babylon, and among them was Daniel. He was one of those Israelites taken into Babylon with his three friends to work in the high court of Babylon. You know, this was because of their royal heritage and his education. So now, they're a minority, surrounded by new culture and new gods. So they serve the king of Babylon. They're taking new names, new clothing styles, and seeking the well-being of the king of Babylon. 
And we might think, wait, hang on a second. Doesn't that mean that they're giving up their heritage? Doesn't that mean they're giving up their identity? Doesn't that mean they are, they're not being who they are? Well, it could seem like that, but Daniel and his friends knew something that would set them apart. They knew something that would stop them from conforming to the patterns of Babylon. They knew where to draw the line. They knew where to draw the line. Turn to the person next to you and say, know where to draw the line. So this is my first point. This was really helpful to me, especially in the first year of university. Shout out to all the people here who have just finished university, or maybe just first year of university. You guys are doing great. So, if your house is anything like mine, you'd find that freedom is a very finite resource. <laughs> it's, not, it's, not, it's not available, you know, a lot. It's very hard to find, for all the good reasons, of course. Right? For all the good reasons. But when I arrived at university, I couldn't help but notice this abundance of freedom that was available to me. I just could do anything that I want. And I, was people, I, and I could see people around me doing anything they wanted because they had the freedom to do so, right? In my good friend Josh Pedro's words, it was, it was tantalizing. It was good. It was very tempting. It was very tempting. But something that really helped me to stay rooted and grounded in the relationship that I had with God was knowing where to draw the line. And it helped me um, sort out three key things that I would like to share with you today. It helped me to prioritize God in my life to put him at the center of my life. Secondly, it helped me to know my identity comes from God and not the labels that the world's going to try to put on me. Thirdly, it helped me to maintain good, godly relationship with the people around me. And we can see here, Daniel also knew that he had to draw a line so that he doesn't conform to the patterns of Babylon, what Babylon was trying to impose on him. See, in chapter 1, verse 5, we can see the king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchen. We're talking the best of the best. Some tasty, delicious food. Wine that's like top tier. But this is what Daniel says in verse 8. But Daniel was determined not to defy himself by eating the food and wine given to him by the king. He asked the chief of the staff for permission not to eat this unacceptable food. And this verse begins by... This phrase revealing that Daniel's, Daniel's inner resolve and his determination. It says, but Daniel was determined not to defile himself. You know, this is just not any casual decisions that he's making. This is not a, just a normal decision that he's making. But he makes a choice at the core of his being that he's not going to let himself be defiled. And we can see that Daniel is not reacting out impulsively. But he's thoughtfully, caref- uh, he's thoughtfully considering the situation. I mean, and we can see his purpose is grounded in conviction and not in convenience. His purpose is grounded in conviction and not in convenience. And church, in this generation, the world is so good at bringing these new ideologies, sugarcoating them into something normal. They will say, yeah, 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 it's normal to speak like that. Yeah, it's normal to think like that. Yeah, yeah, it's normal to walk like that, act like that. Yeah, it's normal to look at things like that on on the internet. It's fine. It's normal. You can do that. But if we don't have the conviction today to stand up and say, no, I'm going to draw the line there. These are not the values that God wants me to live my life by. It will be so easy for us to just fall into this pattern, to conform to the patterns of the world. Why? Because if we don't stand for something, we'll bow down to anything. That's my second point. If we don't stand for something... Will bow down to anything. And the, pers- and the perfect example for this is in Daniel chapter 3. So the context behind this story is, Nana's already pretty much shared quite a lot on this, that King Nebuchadnezzar is building a golden statue that is 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide, which is huge. In the words of Pastor Ellis Morley, mahusif. It's, it's, it's insane. It's big, right? Um, so the king invites his governors and the officials and everyone that's under him to to come to the dedication of this statue. And then to everyone that's there, he gives them a a command. In Daniel chapter 3, verse 4, we see, Then a herald shouted out 
People of all races and nations and languages, listen to the king's command. When you hear the sound of the horn, flutes, the zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and other musical instruments, bow to the ground and worship King Nebuchadnezzar's golden statue. Anyone who refuses to obey will immediately be thrown into the blazing furnace. Are you guys familiar with the concept of cancel culture? Yeah? I would like to think cancel culture is something that was invented back, back in time. But now, if it's cancel culture, we just get banned off social media or something, right? But back then, you get eliminated from the game of life. <laughs> you get gone. When you don't agree with something, they're like, yeah, that's it. That's it. You're gone. But we can see these, after, these, after reading these verses that this is evidently a summon to worship an idol that's in front of them. Right? Nebuchadnezzar asked him to worship this idol that he's built up in front of them. And the definition of an idol is objects or people that are not God, but are worshipped as if they were. Objects or people that are not God, but are worshipped as if they were. So let me ask you a question today. What are the idols that we are bound down to in our lives today? What are we prioritizing today in our lives? Is it money? Is it possession? Is it fame? Is it our popularity on social media? What are we choosing to prioritize in our life today? Yeah, money is important, right? Money is important. Education is important. Maintaining right relationships with people is important. But the moment we begin to prioritize that above God, we are starting to idolize them. And by idolizing them, we're bowing down to them and placing our expectations and our hopes and trusting on them to provide for us, setting ourselves up for disappointment. But church, let me remind you today, we serve a God who does not disappoint, who does not let, let us down. He will never stop showing up for you. He's a God in heaven who will never abandon you or neglect you. The Bible says those who put their hope in him will not be disappointed. And as we read on from verse 7, it says, So at the sound of the musical instrument, all the people, whatever their race, whatever their nation, language, bowed to the ground and worshipped the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. They bowed down and worshipped because they didn't have anything else that was more valuable to stand up for. So they thought, okay, this is, this is something that's valuable. I'm going to bow down and I'm going to worship this. But in verse 12, we can see, but there are some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you have put in charge of the province of Babylon. They pay no attention to you, your majesty. They refuse to serve your gods and do not worship the gold statue. You have set them up. You have set up. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego knew that the God that they served was more valuable than the statue that they have been asked to bow down to. They knew that the God that they serve is bigger than, bigger than King Nebuchadnezzar and any punishment that he could, that could put them in. So the king, he's enraged by this, obviously. Hearing this, there's people just going up to him and snitching on Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they're saying, look, king, like, they don't rate you. They don't rate you. They're not bowing down. They're not worshiping. They're not listening to what you're saying. So the king is enraged. And he calls them up. And he says, look, I'm going to give you another chance to bow down and worship. And I love the way that these three guys reply to the king. This is what they say in verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to define, defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, but even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. See, that faith was on another level. Imagine that. To say that even if he doesn't show up, even if he doesn't show up, we're not going to bow down and worship. They knew to trust in God's character. They knew that God would show up regardless. And so now the king is extremely angry, Right? So he's just going through phases of anger, and he's like, 10 out of 10 now. He's, he's met his limit. So he commands his soldiers to heat up this furnace seven times more than usual. Seven times more than usual. Then he ordered some of the strongest men to bind them up 
and throw them into the furnace. And because the, the fire was so, so hot, because the furnace was so hot, the soldiers that threw them in, they, they were killed by the flames. And in verse 23, he says, So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, securely tied, fell into the roaring flames. But see, the story doesn't end there. Like for the soldiers who just died instantly. But, but the story doesn't end there for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. See, I want us to pay attention to these next couple of verses because God's got some reminding, reminding to do today. He's going to remind us of his character. Because sometimes it becomes so difficult to trust in his character when we're going through difficult seasons in life. It becomes hard to, hard to trust in him. It becomes hard to, uh, to go back and remember all the things that he has been guiding us through, all the things that he has done for us. In verse 24, But suddenly Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement and exclaimed to his advisors, Didn't we tie up three men and throw them into the furnace? Yes, your majesty, we certainly did, they replied. But look, there's Nebuchadnezzar shouted, I see four men unbound, working around in the fire, unharmed. And the fourth one looks like a god. Come on, how many of us can relate to this today, that God showed up for us in the moment of our need? That God was there in the furnace with us? That when we were going through some tough times, God was there with us? Come on, let's give him, let's give him some praise today. Let's give him some praise today. If you have breath in your lungs today, he deserves your praise. God, we thank you. We thank you for the times that you have shown up for us. We thank you for the times that you have never left us down. And as I come to a close, I just want to end with this point. See, when we stand up for God, God will stand with us. Regardless of whatever the situation might be today, there might be some people going through some very difficult times thinking it's really hard to stand up for God. I'm really feeling the pressure. It's just only getting worse and worse. It's only getting hotter and hotter. It's like any moment I'm about to crumble and break. But let me remind you today, when we choose to put our faith in God, He will show up for us. The God that, the same God that showed up for Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, He's not going to stop showing up today. He's going to show up for you today. He's going to turn the very thing that was built to harm you and to hurt you and use it for your good so that his name is glorified. And we can see in verse 28, this is how King Nebuchadnezzar reacts when he finds out that these guys are unharmed, that this fire that he, that he heated up seven times more than usual, that was meant to evaporate him in an instant, did nothing to them, did nothing to them. It says in verse 28, Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angels to rescue the servants who trusted in him. They defied the king's command and were willing to die rather than to serve and worship any other God than their own God. See God, I mean see, people, see church today, when we put our trust in God, he will show up. He will never fail to show up. That's in his character to show up. It's just who he is. He shows up time and time again. In the moments of our needs, he will continue to show up. So I just want to end with in prayer. Father God, we just want to thank you for who you are today. We thank you that it's in your character to show up. Father, I just want to pray for each and every single person here who might be going through some, some tough times in life. Who might be going through some hard times. Father, would you remind them today that, that you're going to stand with them in these times, Father, that you're going to show up for them, that they will make it through because they put their trust in you. Father, we just pray that you would guide them, that you'd hold them close to you. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen.